Praise God. I'm so glad you're here today. I hope you had a great weekend, Thanksgiving and the weekend and all that goes with that. And we're moving into the Christmas season. (laughs) My first, no, this is my second. I guess I had a Christmas sweatshirt once, but Deb decided that I should have a Christmas sweater too. So I'll be wearing this every Sunday for the month of December. (laughs) But it's when we, we're we entering into um, what we celebrate um, as the Christmas season and, and just, uh, it just it's, it's, it's focused in on that birth of Jesus. By, by the way, thank you to everyone who helped and pitched in on the decorations in the place. Don't they look beautiful? They're just really nice. A lot of people pitched in and helped and so we zero in and um, the greatest, uh, what is referred to as the greatest story ever is that, is the story of the sacrifice of Jesus, the um, crucifixion, the death of Jesus, but it couldn't have been done without the life and birth of Jesus. So there's a story in this season that we celebrate, and that story um, travels to that manger and travels to that, that crossroads, and it's a wonderful story, an amazing story. We celebrate that over Christmas and we give, give emphasis to it, even though the world tries to commingle a lot of things and, and distract with a lot of different things. And we participate in a lot of those distractions. It's, that's not wrong, but we bring our attention and we bring our focus back to that manger scene, back to that place where the angels proclaim the coming of the promise of God. It is, it is, a, it is the greatest story ever, God come to earth. And so we're, we're excited about that. Uh, on the idea, I was just meditating this week on the, the topic or the idea of stories. How many of you really like stories? Raise your hand. You like stories in books. You like stories on TV. You like stories in movies. You like, like it when people, nothing like someone who can tell a good story and, um, and, and articulate some event or something that happened and and um, a, lot, a lot of stories begin with once upon a time and um, um, it kind of gets you started. It moves you to that place of beginnings. There's beginnings and there's a travel as the, as the theme develops and as the, uh, the tensions develop and as they're resolved. And how many of you love a movie that doesn't have an ending to it? <laughs> yeah, I thought so. Not too many of you. And um, they get you with those, and some movies end that way, and the critics say, wonderful, marvelous, and, and Rotten Tomato people say, oh, that was the worst thing I've ever seen. They didn't finish it. They didn't end it. We like, we like things to be tied up and ended. But um, the story, um, God, our God is a storyteller. Our God is a God of, of putting on display and... and, and um, Putting into a flow, the things that are happening, the, the things that are the, there's a beginning and there's a, a, a traveling through and then there's an end and and we see that and God, the best storyteller ever, he did a beginning in Genesis one one. He didn't say once upon a time, but the word of God says in the beginning, in the beginning. For us, there's a start to the story. For us, there's a beginning and. Uh, uh, December, this month that we celebrate uh, the birth of God's son Jesus, his birth marks the beginning of the third chapter of a story that God is telling. And I'm going to just talk about that story here today. Uh, let's look at the story that God is telling us. Part one is that story that begins in Genesis, that in the beginning introduction that we have. And um, in the story, there are many activities, many actions, many twists and many turns, but, but the setting of that story and the theme or the idea that I think God wants to strongly convey, at least one of the themes, is God with us. God with us. You know, when the angels came and they proclaimed um, the, the arrival of Jesus, they, they said his name shall be called Emmanuel, and that word means God with us. And so we have there in that, in the birth of Jesus, an introduction and a proclamation 
of God with us. God was with us. But in the beginning of the story, in the garden, God was with us. God was with Adam and Eve. This is the first part of that story, the first chapter, if you will. Genesis 3.8 says, And they, Adam and Eve, heard the sound of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from God. <clears throat> That's As I looked for that, as I looked for God's interaction with them, I see God involving Adam and naming the animals. And I looked for other um, hints of kind of what went on in that garden. And that garden became the the habitation of God here on earth. The garden was uh, interestingly described as, as a watered place, as a lush place. And Adam and Eve were there and and it's, it's fun of the fact that wherever God inhabits is lush and watered. Wherever God inhabits has life to it. And there were parameters around that garden. And outside of that garden was wilderness. And, and, but inside that garden was that place of creation and that place of God's presence. And that verse in Genesis chapter 3 says <clears throat> that God was walking in the garden uh, in the cool of the day, whatever part of the day that was and it seemed like it hints to us that that was kind of a regular thing where they met with God during that time but they were hiding because they had sinned because they were ashamed because they had uh, disobeyed God but this was God in daily face-to-face fellowship with man and we kind of get an impression we get an understanding I think I don't think it's wrong for us to assume that that's what God had in mind at the beginning God had in mind at the beginning that we, his children, his sons and daughters, would have fellowship with him, that we'd be about his business, naming animals and, and tending to the garden, which he commanded for them to do. But there would be a time of fellowship, a time where we would walk with God, where we would just talk face to face with him. It's what God had intended. But the disobedience of man disrupted that plan that he had. And then after being kicked out of the garden, We see God still pursuing, still talking to man. We don't see an end of his voice there. We see, uh, for instance, in Genesis 4, 6, God said to Cain, these are the the accounts of God speaking to man. God said to Cain, um, why are you angry? He was talking uh, to him about his attitude toward his brother. And this was before Cain killed Abel. And then later on in verse 9, um, um, uh, after, after the fact, after that um, murder, God says, where is your brother? And so we see there that God was still conversing with his creation, still attempting to keep that connection and hold that connection. We see later on in Genesis 5, 22, we, we read of a man named Enoch, and it says doesn't tell us a whole lot about Enoch, but it says he walked with God. And um, you, get, you get kind of a sense... As, as you read the other verses, that that was a kind of a unique thing in that time. That mostly people didn't walk with God. But that Enoch stood out because he walked with God. And, and I don't know if he walked with God the way Adam and Eve walked with God. But he walked with God so intimately that God says to Enoch, you're not going to die, I'm just going to take you. I'm just going to take you and you're going to... It's like if you hang out with God enough, you just get lost with him. He just... He just takes you out of whatever situation there is. And, and, and I, I, I think there's some people that live that way. It's, a, it's an amazing thing and an interesting thing. But the, the, this was the picture after the fall of God still walking with a few people. And I don't think it was a few people that God said, I choose you. Um, I, think, I think God uh, God is a God of whosoever will. That's what my Bible says. And so... Whoever responds to his spirit can walk close to God like that. But it came to a point and it came to a place in the world in that that, um, first chapter of how God walked with man. In Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 it says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man, I want you to pay attention to this verse, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continuously. This doesn't give us a picture of spots of righteousness here and pockets of people who walked with God there. 
it gives us a picture of one man, Enoch. Well, later we would see that it was more than one, so I guess we'll leave room for at least one other family, Noah's family. But it says here, these words are, are very interesting, and I didn't look at the Hebrew and, and see how strongly that these words are, but it's, it's in the translation it's worded very strongly. The wickedness of men was great in the earth, and that not some, not a portion of, but every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continuously. So what we have here, and, and I'm not going to go into it um, um, here today, but we have here what was set up and circumstances were set up where there was an infiltration of such wickedness and such evil in the world that all of the creation, human creation of the world, had turned their backs on God, did not seek God, did not listen to God, but only pursued and only listened to their flesh, you can only imagine, and I don't want you to imagine there very long, but just for a brief moment, you can only imagine the wickedness that went on, the wickedness of man. I, don't, I think you could maybe take a snapshot of the world that's out there today and the craziness that's going on, and you could and, 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 and imagine that it's worse than that because there's nothing holding, holding things back. So then we see in verse 8 of chapter 6 that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, so God did a flood. There was an extermination of every living, living being except for um, Noah and his family. And it's interesting that, that those who mark the timeline of people during the time and when they died or when they disappeared from the face of the earth was that Enoch left right before the flood. Right before the flood. For a study for you, that's a little Old Testament picture of the rapture, by the way. But anyway, I'll continue on took Enoch out and destroyed all of his creation. It broke his heart to do it, but they had all turned their back on him. They were pursuing evil all the time. But man, uh, uh, so, uh, so God did a flood, and then he, and he's going to start over with Noah. But man continued in rebellion. Out from the ark they came. There was a multiple, multiplication of offspring, and we see a, a time period described uh, in the Bible, where where they didn't disperse, they didn't do what God had commanded, go 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 everywhere and and um, and bring the earth under your under man's management, under my supervision. They stayed in one place and they became strong and they wove together. They wove together wickedness of all kinds. And you see a uh, you see in the Old Testament a description of those who became skilled in, in metallurgy and those who became skilled in stonework and those who became skilled in all kinds of things. And there's a, a sense that they also sought out uh, uh, wisdom and knowledge in the dark arts and wisdom and knowledge in, in wickedness and evil. And Satan was very active in, in, um, in meeting them with the wicked desires of their hearts. And so we see in Genesis 11.4, we see the people there gathered together in one place and they said, this is what they said. They said, let's build a city. Let's make a tower reaching to heaven. And let's make a name for ourselves. Literally, literally, we are seeking a reputation. We are seeking fame. We are seeking glory for ourselves. This was their, this was their plan, their motive. And so they began building and again, there's a whole side story here of, of, of they, they literally were building a huge, huge structure I, to, to do just a, a brief side road here. If you imagine and picture the pyramids, if you imagine and picture the Mayan ruins, if you imagine and picture those huge big structures, then imagine and picture what the people of that day were capable of. And they were literally... They were literally, say, literally saying, we're going to build a tower that... that and, and part of what, what some surmise was behind this is that we're not going anywhere. We're going to build this tower and we're going to go out as far as we can go and still see the tower. And we're going to stay together. And, and, and the, 
the gathering together of those people and the staying together of those people would sustain and maintain the wickedness that they were delving into and that they were yielding to. And so God said, that can't be. I need to do something about that. So what God did here, not a flood, not wiping everyone out. But in verse 8 it says, so God confused their languages and dispersed them all over the face of the earth. So the flood was a pretty amazing thing, but this was kind of uh, um, just as amazing in its own way. In 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 a a wave of his hand, or or something like that, he he divided them, or put division between them, and God smacked them all with different languages, and so now they can't understand each other, and so now with the different groups and the different languages they dispersed uh, into the world and and that cut that plot and plan of man off. And so it's at this point they've dispersed, they've gone to different parts of the known world there and they've separated and so the, the accelerated move to make a name for themselves and be famous on the earth was thwarted. And this is where we, we find kind of an introduction to chapter 2. God says, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm here, whosoever will come to me, and you get like Noah for a season, his offspring for a season, so that's good. You've got Enoch, but it's not going too good, so God changes his plan, and he shifts his plan, and he goes down, and he talks to a man named Abram. Abram, and Abram marks the beginning of chapter 2. God says, to you I'm coming and I'm speaking And I want you to go out from your land. I want you to move. And and, and there's a strategic idea here. I want you to move from the influences around you. I want you to move from your people. And he says, and this is very strong and pointed, I will make of you a people. I will make of you a people. And he sends him forward and I will bless you. And I will protect you, and I will provide for you, and I will supply for you, and I'll bless your family so that you'll have offspring and so that your influence can grow and build my presence in the world. See, the, the, the thing of Abraham and the thing of the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, is such a, such a, 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 a strategery of God to... to Uh, because the Bible tells us and it emphasizes to us there was nothing special about Abram. There was nothing nothing particularly gifted about Abram. He wasn't Superman. All he was was a man who would say yes to God, who would go out from his people, who would walk with God. And so he did, and God blessed him. And he poured out his blessing upon him. And then he said, anyone who blesses you will be blessed by me. So here's, the, here's chapter 2. Chapter 2 shows a whole new strategy by God of carrying his presence out into the world and affecting those around. And we see the story unfold through, through um, uh, many years. We see God at work highlighting this one group for other people to see, a group set apart, a group that, that built a name for God, a group that lived under the blessing, the family from which would come the Savior, And we see that expanding. And in that group, or in that chapter, we see the story unfolding of Abraham leaving, of of the people coming under Egypt's oppression, of Moses going forth from that. But that's all Abram's offspring. Then Abraham and Sarah, all his offspring. That's all part of the same chapter. And then we see through the wilderness, it's enhanced And it's even made bigger and made clearer because here they are marching through the wilderness. Um, What is six million? Six million Jews or something like that or three million or four million? Many million. Um, I, I, I don't forget exactly. There's a lot of different numbers there, but it was in the millions. And they're walking through the wilderness. Deb and I won't even go to Green Bay to visit Katie without snacks in the back of the car, okay? And they're they're like heading out of Egypt with just what they can carry out into the wilderness. And it says the Bible, (laughs) this is such a miraculous, fun thing. The Bible portrays and depicts that a rock followed them in the wilderness, that they would go, they would move, they would camp, and that out of this rock would flow water. 
And the rock in the New Testament said, this rock is Jesus. But anyway, that rock followed him. What kind of rock can put out water for three million, four million, multiple millions of people? I don't know. Manna comes down and feeds them. So we see through the wilderness, through the, through the barren desert, and now people around, the fear of the Lord comes into them. And so we see God's plan unfolding and God's plan revealing itself as he shows himself Ooh, uh, Israel's God. Oh, we don't want to mess with them. You know their God. There's a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire and anybody who goes against them and any time they went against them and with any hope of victory or any hope of winning, they always had to get two, three of the kings together or five of the kings together to come and even then uh, God would, would, uh, would defend them and, and take care of them. So we see God in chapter 2 revealing himself through those who would follow after him and the revelation of God becomes a little stronger, a little more obvious. It doesn't, it doesn't make everybody uh, follow God, but, but he's showing himself mighty on the earth. And so then we get, get this traveling and then we get to the, be, the start of chapter 3 or the introduction or the explosion onto the scene of chapter 3. God with us in a different way. We see the birth of Jesus. And his name is called Emmanuel, God with us. So now God isn't just being worshipped with us exteriorly from, from Abraham's offspring, the Jews. Now we've got this person, Jesus, walking around and he is God with us. Now we see God in a different way. We see God in flesh and blood. We see God in a transition here, not of judgment, but of love, not of not of difficulty in law, but of grace and of a new, a new strange different power that he's preaching and saying will be theirs. Matthew 1, 22 through 23 said, All of this is done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So in part one, we see God with us in the garden and face to face with a few. Part two, we see God with us, with, with Abraham traveling through the land and putting God on display in every imaginable situation. And now we see God really with us in flesh and blood, in the form of a human being, from the words, from the thoughts, from the ideas. Um, you've heard it said, this, but I say to you this. He's modifying, he's clarifying they're seeing things, I don't understand this, I don't understand that. He's bringing that story and unfolding that story in a greater measure. John 1.14 says, And the Word became flesh. I love that he's the Word. Can I say that the story became flesh and dwelt among us? I mean, stories are made of words, right? The story became flesh and dwelt among us, and he revealed himself to us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus' short life is amazing. In it, he patterned the life that he would have us live toward God, listening to God, following God, doing what he saw the Father do, saying what he heard the Father say. And then at the end of part three of the story, at the end of chapter three, if you will, where he comes to earth, he accomplished the work that the Father sent him to accomplish. John chapter 17, verse 4. Listen to this very carefully. Jesus said, I have glorified you, talking to the Father, on earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And then it moves to chapter 4. When he died on the cross, and when his, he was glorified, and when he took his place at the right hand of the Father... He was accomplishing that third chapter, that third revelation of God with us. And next what would come would be something miraculous, something amazing, something that we still have a hard time grasping. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Christ was God with us. Now Christ is God in 
us. Here's a phrase, God in me. Say that phrase, God in me. Say it again, God in me. God in me. For all those uh, who are at home and listening and all the amazing Bible scholars that are tuning in to find things that we say wrong, I did not say I am God. But God's word is very clear that says, He dwells in me. This week, how strongly did you sense that? This week, how many times did you say, Wow, God is in me? I'd be, I, I didn't. I'd be surprised if there, I, I'm sure there's a handful of people that reminded themselves or reminded, were reminded of that. But that's what I'm going to talk about. That's the big thing I want to talk about. I know I was talking big about the other things, but this is the really big thing. Christ in me, the hope of glory. Galatians 2.20 describes how Christ lives in me. It says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I love that he said that. Because that separates all those who say, well, my flesh and my spirit, they're separate. And so what my flesh does, it does. And it can, it can just do what it does. But my spirit is separate. There are people who think that. What I do in the flesh is not really the real me. And what I do in the spirit is the real me. So I'm not, I'm not um, judged by what's in my flesh. Your flesh is judged. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I li- live but it's no longer I live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, talking, breathing, eating, walking in this world, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. I'm crucified. I'm dead to myself. The life that I live in this natural realm, I live supernaturally in this natural realm, and I do it by faith. And 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, Jesus Christ is in me. Jesus Christ is in you if you've surrendered to him. I just, I don't want to move off that for a minute. I want you to, I want you, if you have to do like I do and clutch your heart and just remind me, Jesus, you're in me. Jesus, you're in me. And what I want to ask you today is, how free is Jesus in me? How active is Jesus in me? How powerful is Jesus in me? Because I want to suggest to you today that Christ in you is all of Christ in you. Not part of Christ. Not a hint of Christ. Not a scent of Christ. But all of Christ is in you. And so why is my life so short of what I imagine it could be? And the only conclusion I can come to is that I've got him in less space than he wants to occupy. And that he's not there because he's not, he's not small there because he's not powerful. He is powerful. But he's small there because he will only inhabit the space that I allow him to inhabit. And and occupying that space are things like distractions, things like emotions or fears, things like things like things like things. And so God, how can I have manifested in me more of Christ? Christ grows in you, or in other words, his reality grows in you. Galatians 6, 8 says, For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh... I'm, I'm not, this isn't talking to unsaved people. This is talking to, bo- to born-again people. 
He who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And so here's the thing. I can plant to the flesh or I can plant to the Spirit. 1 Peter 2, 1 and 2 says, So get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit. Be done with hypocrisy and jealousy and all unkind speech. Like newborn babies, you must crave the pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. What's a full experience of salvation? It doesn't mean that you're, well, let me phrase this the way I need to phrase it. It doesn't mean you're not saved. It doesn't mean you're not cleansed. It doesn't mean you're not, you didn't, I, don't, I don't want to use the old phrases. It doesn't mean you're not in a relationship with God by Christ. It doesn't mean that. The full experience of salvation me, means getting saved in every area of your life. I'm saved to the salvation of my soul for the forgiveness of sins. But am I saved in yielding unkind speech? Am I saved against jealousy? Am I saved against hypocrisy? Am I saved against deceit and all of those other things? Am I walking salvation? Am I walking in victory in those areas in my life? Now, I, I promise you I'm in the Christmas spirit. I'm happy. December's a great time. Celebrate the life of Jesus. And, and you and I are shoulder to shoulder. We're, we're fighting the fight. We're, we're walking the good walk. We're, we're doing it. These are fine-tuning elements. These are elements of, of realizing a greater victory and a greater intimacy with God. I won't go there. I'm not going to go there. Don't go there. <laughs> Ephesians 4, 14 through 15. You're welcome, Deb. Ephesians 4, 14 and 15. Don't be any more like immature children, not tossed here and there by waves and carried by every wind of doctrine, by trickery of people. But speaking the truth in love, we grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, that is Christ. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, We are being transformed into the image of the Lord from glory to glory. Now, I prepared this message toward the beginning of the week, and I've had just a tough week. Not tough in the, not tough in the sense of things were going bad or things were going wrong, but I, had, I was just fighting an inner battle, and not an inner battle that I could put my finger on, and not an inner battle that I... I said the name of Jesus. I proclaimed the blood of Jesus. And that battle, that that was just... It was just... I wasn't... It was just a battle. It was just a battle. And I just had in the back of my mind, I think that's where my spirit dwells. I wish I could move it up farther forward. But in the back of my mind, I had this idea, hold on, this is a battle trust in God. You know, some battles are won victoriously where you break through and where you shout and dance. But some battles are won where you walk out off the battlefield all dirty and all tattered and you go in and you take a shower and you put on good clothes and you go, man, that was a battle, but praise God for the victory. You know what I mean? Amen. Some battles some battles are won by you just hanging in there and not doing anything dumb with your mouth. Some battles are won with you just holding on and not bruising anybody nearby. And you come out the other side and you go, praise God, that was the pits. That was nuts. But praise God, he gives me the victory. Amen? Amen. Some battles are that way. But 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, we're being transformed into the image of the Lord from glory to glory. From glory to glory to glory, from glory to glory. I shouldn't do it this way. I should go from glory to glory, from glory to glory, from glory to glory. You ever start a new job and you didn't know what you were doing? They said, we're going to start training today. And you go, oh, good. Somebody's going to finally explain to me what goes on around here. And they say, Bob, come over here. Here's Steve. Take him out there. And Bob, you know how he's going to train me? He's going to just 
have me fall flat on my face 16 times. You, you've started jobs like that where they say they're going to train you and then you stand out there and you go, well, who's going to train me? And they say, yeah, yeah, it's going on right now. This is it. It's going on right now. And so you go and you fall on your face and you get up and you fall down and you get up and you fall down. and That's training. That's life's training. But then you learn and then you learn and then you learn and then if you keep the sweetness of the presence of God on you, you won't, and you're, you're here now, and Bob's gone, he's retired. <laughs> Dumb old Bob. But you're here, and a new person comes in, and now you're the Bob. And you can do it just like Bob, or you can remember how it was with Bob, and you can be full of the Holy Ghost and have some compassion and help them learn a different way. That's how we are as believers. But from glory to glory to glory. That's what you're doing right now. With Christ in me, I'm growing from glory to glory to glory. And so when I'm going through it, you're patient with me and I'm patient with you. And then we move to another place. And, and hopefully we don't get stuck there. We don't get stuck there. And you keep from getting stuck there by yielding to the Lord, by saying yes, by staying humble, by staying soft by staying receptive to what he has for you. So, how do we cooperate? Well, this means we surrender this means the surrender of the wounded, broken, misinformed, misshapen parts of me as God heals and builds and reshapes me. Philippians 4:18, I think I marked that in my Bible. Let me open that. <clears throat> my messages when i when i prepare them they start at the beginning of the week and then they just they're kind of crock pot kind of things they sit in there and i open the lid and i put something else in there and this morning i scribbled a bunch of stuff off and 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 found this verse finally brethren here you go we don't just think about stopping the negative we think about how do i build the positive in me finally brethren whatever things are true whatever things are noble Whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. <clears throat> meditate on these things. We have a culture in a world today that resists you meditating on good things with every fiber of its being. With every fiber of its being. If you can't watch the news without losing your victory, don't watch the news. It's not helping you anyway. I'm not telling people to not watch the news. I watch the news. But I'm trying to pray more for the junk that I see. But if you can't, then don't. Begin to set aside time. Begin to set aside time where you meditate on the things of God and the goodness of God. Begin to set aside time where you pray where you pray. I know you pray. Oh God, help me get through this traffic. I know you pray. Oh God, help me find a good deal on Black Friday. I know you pray. I know you pray. We all pray those prayers. But I'm talking about where you set yourself aside for a little while. Start with some time and where you get in his presence and where you meditate on some things. And while you're meditating on those good things, meditate on some of the things that are that are that are um, booby traps in your life, that are trip wires in your life, that are difficulties in your life. Meditate on those in the presence of the Lord and say, Lord, come into these things and show me how you want to change them. This is how we build up ourselves in the Lord. And, 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 and this, is the, uh, 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 this is the completion of our salvation. The end of our life is the beginning of chapter 5. And that's the beginning of, I mean, you're already in your eternal life, but it's the next phase of your eternal life. The eternal life outside of the bonds and outside of the boundaries of the presence of sin, where you're either dead and in the presence of the Lord or whether you get raptured in the presence of the Lord like Enoch did. That's the next chapter. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. There is a 
group of believers in this world that say, don't, you know, heaven's not the reason that, heaven's not the reason that we're believers. Heaven, heaven is the final reward. It just is. I, you can't get away from that. I mean, <clears throat> live laying down your life for the world like Jesus did, but I look forward to heaven. Uh, DNR all the way, please. DNR. If I go, don't bring me back unless you need something really bad. I guess I'll forgive you. But I, I'm, I'm ready. I want to go to heaven. Reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Again, that picture of salvation. When you accepted Christ, and where is Christ now? In me. But also there is a reward reserved in heaven for you. And, 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 and this dynamic is building and growing in me. There's a whole other picture that I don't have time to describe. But in 1 John 4, 4, it says, You are God and have overcome, and because greater, uh, because greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Amen. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. <clears throat> because he overcomes... I overcome. And does that mean my life is all hunky-dory and yippy-skippy and nothing ever happens to me? No, but it means on my lips are praise to God in the midst of every situation I find myself in. Christ in me. Let me do something here. Before I do something, let me do something else. I need some music back there. Give me some little light stuff there for background. Before I move forward in, 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 in my altar call or in my response that I want to present to you an opportunity to do, there might be someone in here who's never surrendered your life to Jesus. You've never prayed, and this, uh, you've probably heard this a million times, but this is how you do it. You, you've, you've been pricked, you've been nudged by the Holy Spirit in your heart to say, I've never done that. I've never surrendered my life to God. I've never accepted the death of His Son. See, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And so for anybody in this world to be reunited in relationship to God God made a way for that to happen, not through your works, not through your family lineage, not through money, not through any other way except by him giving his son. He did it all. He gave his son. And his son, his perfect son, his sinless son, died on a cross. And he paid the price for your sin. You are on death row, you are on death row, and he died in your place. That's as simple as I can make it for you. And for you to step into that relationship with God, you don't, have to, you don't have to have money. You don't have to be better. You don't have to be gooder. You don't have to be nicer. You don't have to be sweeter. You don't have to be from a better family. You don't have to do anything other than say, in a prayer, everybody bow your heads. You, you don't have to do anything but say in a prayer, Lord, I'm not worthy of your love, but I thank you that you love me. God loved the world so much that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him won't perish but have everlasting life. You gave your son to die for me, to pay for my sins so that I wouldn't have to stand in the judgment day and pay for my own sins. And so, Lord, right now, first of all, in your presence I say, God, I'm sorry for my sins. I'm sorry that I fall short. I'm sorry that I'm in this place and I'm sad that I'm in this place and I'm going <clears> to <throat> I'm going to surrender to you right now. And if you've never surrendered to God like that, you pray this prayer with me. You don't have to do it out loud. Just pray it with me. Heavenly Father, I surrender my life right now. I turn from my ways and I follow you. And I accept the payment of the blood of Jesus for sins in my life. I accept it. Thank you for saving me. Thank you that 
in this act, you will miraculously inhabit me, that Jesus will miraculously come into my life and come into my heart, and he'll begin to, to commune with me. Your word says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. The Spirit of God says, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. And so, Jesus, I invite you into my heart to have fellowship with me, to teach me, to lead me, to guide me so that I can live from glory to glory, so that I can move from glory to glory, so that I can find victory in the midst of my trials. I invite you in right now. I want everyone in the room to say, I invite you in right now. I invite you in right now, Jesus. My life is yours. And I thank you that I can be counted among the brothers and sisters in the kingdom of God. Amen. I want you all to stand. We're going to continue to pray for a few other things. <clears throat> stand to your feet. Today, if you've accepted Christ and he's living in you, I don't mean just today, but if you're a believer and he's living in you, and during the course of this message, the Holy Spirit quickened you and said, this is an area that I need for you to carve off some time and replace what you're doing there with time in my presence. I want you just to surrender that. I want you to give it a try. I want you to draw close to me and I'll draw close to you. If the Holy Spirit quickened you at any time during the service with something like that, I want you to take a move of faith and I want you to step out of your seat and come up into the altar area. There's going to be a lot of people here. Just move right now. There was something that said, I need to lay this aside. I need to lay this aside. Come to the altar area right now. When you come first, come up close because there's going to be a bunch of people in behind you. Come right now. Come on up. Come on up. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Anyone who is quickened by the Spirit that says, I need to lay that down. I need to back off on that. I need to lessen that. I need to remove that. My crowded life is crowding out Jesus, and I want to give him more space in my life. I want to give him more space in my life. I want to give him more space in my life. It's just going to take a minute. I'm not going to keep you long. I'm not going to have you do anything other than to just respond by walking down that aisle and coming to this altar. We're going to have a prayer together. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to give you a minute. Thank you, Jesus, to make room for you. Christ in me. Jesus in me. Jesus in me. I want to give you more room. I want to give you more space. I want you foremost on my mind to accelerate my growth from glory to glory to glory. <laughs> yes, Jesus. Wow. Yes, Jesus. Just imagine, just imagine what a bigger Jesus in you. Not big because he's not big already, but big because you give him room. Just imagine what he'll do. Just imagine how you'll view things and see things. Just imagine how the world around you will be changed. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Heavenly Father, right now in Jesus' name, we say yes to you. Yes to Christ in me, the hope of glory. Lord, I just pray right now in Jesus' name for those down here in this altar area who have responded by faith and said, yes, more of you. I pray for surprises. I pray for revelation. I pray for bigness, Lord God. Bigness. Bigness in areas that have been struggles and bigness in areas that they've not even imagined. Be big in us, Lord Jesus. Be big in us. Everyone say this with me. Jesus lives in me. Lord Jesus... Be big in me. Lord Jesus, 
I made more space for you. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for coming for me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus.